you shouldn't be stretching for tendon pain. You've probably heard similar advice before, whether you're dealing with Achilles tendon pain, gluteal tendinopathy, proximal hamstring tendinopathy, or even rotator cuff issues, that you should be avoiding stretching because it increases the compressive loading in between the tendon and the bone, and that leads to some more irritation. But should we actually be avoiding stretching because of these increases in compressive loading? And if so, how long should we be doing that for? In this video, we'll go over the structural changes that we see that occur with compressive loading, when and if we should be avoiding stretching because of those compressive loads, and what this actually means for our rehab programs. But before we get started, don't forget to hit that like button. Before talking about what structural changes we sometimes see with compressive loading, we should probably start off by talking about what is compressive loading for the tendon. And so if we use this as our example, this will be our tendon, and then my elbow here. As I bring my elbow into flexion, we can see that there's more stretch on the tendon, and this would be compressive loading for this tendon. If we look at the Achilles tendon as another example, as we bring our foot up into dorsiflexion, that would be increasing the compressive loads in between the Achilles tendon and the calcaneus bone, which is your heel bone. And then similarly, if we look at the rotator cuff, specifically the supraspinatus tendon, that as I bring my arm back into extension, I would be increasing the compressive loads on the front of my shoulder, which is where the supraspinatus tendon is. And the tendon's response to increases in compressive loading is to increase its production of large proteoglycans, which we can think of as a sponge, in that it'll pull fluid into the tendon, which is a short-term mechanism to help protect it from these increases in compressive loading. While this response is helpful in the short term in that it helps us deal with the increases in compressive loading, or really just loading in general, it's also been implicated in the beginning stages of tendon pathology in that what happens generally, or what should happen, is that as there's an increase in load, the tendon swells a little bit, but then once the loading stops, the fluid goes back out of the tendon. But with the early stages of tendon pathology, the fluid just stays in the tendon for longer periods of time. And so going back to that sponge analogy, in between each use, the sponge should probably dry out. But what ends up happening is that the sponge just stays wet for longer periods of time. And because of this, the common recommendation has been to either avoid or limit the amount of compression that we're putting on these tendons so that we're not causing some of these structural changes. But it's important to note that when we look at some of the animal studies, that compression alone didn't seem to actually cause some of these structural changes. It was either tensile loading, which is what we generally think of when we think of uh, tendon uh, loading, is that whenever we contract the muscle, there's a stretch on the tendon, that's tensile loading, or it was tensile loading plus compression. So tensile loading plus compression that would cause those structural changes. So it might not be as simple as just going through and causing compression of the tendon, that there actually has to be more load involved to cause some of these structural changes. So what does this mean when we look at rehab programs for tendon pain? Should we be avoiding stretching and should we be avoiding compressive loading? Well, this is where things get a little bit interesting when we start looking at rehab programs for tendon pain. And what I mean by this is that we frequently do see that we load into end range positions. So if we look at the Achilles tendon, the most common protocol that we use is an eccentric loading protocol where somebody will be on a step and they'll lower their heel down into dorsiflexion. So we're loading them into end range positions under load. And we might make the distinction that, well, for a mid portion Achilles tendinopathy, that would be appropriate to be loading into that full range position. But if it's an insertional tendinopathy, well, then we should stop at neutral so that we're minimizing those compressive loads. But there was a research article that looked at this, and what they did was they used a modified eccentric loading protocol, and the modification was that they held the end position for 15 to 20 seconds, so it was actually more of a stretch. And what they found was that the mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy group did have better results than the insertional Achilles tendinopathy group. However, the insertional tendinopathy group was actually very similar. It was just a little bit less in terms of their outcome. And so how much do we actually need to avoid these compressive loads for insertional tendinopathy? And I think this is actually a very important point, especially for those with chronic tendinopathy cases, because there tends to be a fear of compressive loading. So they'll tend to avoid ankle dorsiflexion for the Achilles tendon, knee flexion for the patellar tendon, or hip flexion for the proximal hamstring tendon because there's a fear that it will make the tendinopathy worse. But the thing is, is that 
the tendon actually needs to be exposed to compressive loads to be able to better tolerate that because if we completely avoid it, it's going to be very challenging for that tendon to actually be able to adapt to compressive loading. So we don't need to go full into whatever range of motion is provocative, but eventually we do need to start increasing those compressive loads so the tendon can tolerate them. So in summary, compressive loading is a factor in the development of tendon pain, but we don't need to completely avoid stretching or compressive loading in the rehab program. If it's painful, we might temporarily avoid it, but we need to eventually add it back into the program so that the tendon can adapt to it. Thank you for watching this video on compressive loading and tendinopathy. I hope that you found this information useful. If you did, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up. If you want to see more of my content, hit the subscribe button over to the side here. I'll see you guys in the next video.